So welcome everybody uh, to, to CPI Live. My name is Anita Banasetic. I'm a partner at the law firm of Davies Ward, Phillips and Weinberg in Toronto. And I am really pleased to have Jean Pratt, Chris Pike and Catherine Batchelor here with me today. Just by way of brief introduction, I'll start with Chris. Chris is uh, formerly at the OECD, but is now a partner and managing director at Federis, an economics firm focused on antitrust litigation. Uh, we also have Jean Pratt, who is a senior deputy commissioner of the mergers and monopolist monopolistic practices branch at the Competition Bureau, and Catherine Batchelor, who is the director of the Digital Markets Unit of the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK. So welcome everybody and thank you for joining our panel today. I wanted to start, I guess, with Jean and Chris, just to give a bit of background on the issue that we'll be getting into in a little bit more detail today. And that's really the concept of inclusive competition as we've been calling it. And maybe Jean, if I can start with you, you know, the Bureau has been really at sort of the forefront of this idea of inclusive competition. And for those people that may not be as familiar with what you know, the topic entails or how to think about this issue, can you give us a sense of where this all started from your end? Uh, sure. Um, before I start, I did want to say that you know, any opinions or, or uh, views I share are mine and, and don't necessarily reflect the, the Competition Bureau of Canada or the Commissioner. But uh, I'll start with where this all started for us was really a larger Government of Canada initiative uh, a few years ago called Gender Based Analysis Plus. So I'll use the moniker GBA Plus. It's not a program, it's not a policy in and of itself, but it really was just sort of the launch of an, of an analytical tool for Government of Canada, for public servants, to identify assumptions and ask questions to assess how diverse groups of people may experience government policies, programs, and initiatives. So in essence, it's really about us uh, as public servants um, thinking about the foundational assumptions, the objectives, the design, and the implementation of various policies and programs just to make sure that we're not missing impacts or unintended consequences in design and implementation. So the one thing I'd want to make clear is GBA plus is not, it's not so, sort of something outside of our policy or legal framework under the Competition Act. It's really a tool within our existing framework that may lead to more, we're hoping will lead to more nuanced thinking and analysis. The first kind of trigger for us as an agency to start thinking about this was in 2018. Uh, when we were asked to start conducting this analysis on the competition chapters of Canada's free trade agreements. So we, we, we looked at this and we we're like, okay, well, where do we start? Because uh, it wasn't evident to us. Uh, so we went to do some research on the intersection of competition and diverse identity factors. And we realized there wasn't a whole lot on the topic, but what we did find was this great paper written by Chris uh, that's called What's Gender Got to Do with Competition Policy? And so, you know, Chris's paper led to the Bureau connecting with the OECD Competition Committee on the topic um, and, and bringing it to the agenda of the OECD Competition Committee meetings. And then we, we, we sort of doubled down on our investment. We tried to get some funding from the Department of Innovation, Science and Economic Development to, to, to get funding to, for the OECD Gender and Competition Policy Project, uh, which has been going on now for a couple of years. So I think um, what I would say is, you know, it's been a couple of years. Uh, it's not like a new policy for us. Uh, and we're still really at the beginning of the process. Um, but as we've learned more, we see a huge opportunity to help us contribute to our core mandate. And especially post pandemic, when we're looking at economic recovery and growth in Canada. Um, I think most, uh, most agencies around the world, you know, in Canada, the pandemic has disproportionately impacted some of society's most vulnerable, and that's resulted in worse, worsened economic outcomes, not only for those vulnerable populations, but also for Canada's economic growth and productivity overall. So, you know, we see this as, an, as, as core to our mandate to harness the opportunity for healthy recovery um, to support inclusive growth. Uh, so that we, we unlock the greatest opportunity for participation in all sectors from all sources. 
Um, and, and, you know, as, as a competition policy wonk, uh, this is where competition comes into the mix. You know, we, we need to support growth uh, by doing, by letting competition do its job to drive greater innovation and productivity. Um, so we're, we're kind of at the beginning of thinking about ways that we can incorporate consideration of these factors into our existing mandate and, and legal framework. Um, so I, I don't know, Anita, if you wanted me to go into some of the ways that we're thinking this could impact our work, or I can leave it at that for now. So why don't we, um, Jean, go to Chris. Chris can give us his background. You mentioned the paper that Chris had written um, initially. And then, Jean, I, I would love to come back to you and, and, and maybe um, we can get into a bit of a you know, more deeper dive of, at some of the, the considerations that the Bureau is looking at, as you say, when bringing it into its work and, and framework. Um, but Chris, maybe just to get a, a you know bit of that sort of grounding context, maybe you can tell us how you started looking at this issue and sort of the impetus. I think there's a neat story there in terms of why you even started to write about the topic in the first place. Yeah, thanks, Anita. Um, yeah, so I guess I started. I mean, so in 2017, I was writing um, with colleagues at the OECD a paper about uh, wealth and income inequality. Uh, and how competition policy uh, interacted with that and you know the fact that competition policy can help us uh, address to some extent um, wealth and income inequality and so after after having done that I kind of the next step I suppose uh, in, in the thinking was to think well is there is there any sort of connection with gender inequality uh, and so at the end of that year I started thinking about you know what are the connections there uh, and that was quite for me, you know, a really um, uh, interesting topic. Um, my wife was uh, running a, um, setting up a mentoring program for uh, women entrepreneurs in developing countries. Uh, and so I was having a lot of conversations with her about, you know, the barriers to entrepreneurship for, for, for women trying to start businesses and so forth and thinking about, you know, competition policy more generally. Um, but it was really interesting to bring it down to, to, to kind of to antitrust itself uh, I guess my kids were also going through childcare at that time, so I was kind of getting familiar with these, some of the dysfunctions of these childcare markets at the time and thinking, wow, this must be able to work better than this, right? And this must be having other effects. So, so I kind of put that through all those sort of threads into a blog, really, um, uh, to try and answer the question, as, as Jean says, what's, what's gender got to do with competition policy? Uh, a bit of a Tina Turner sort of reference there. Um, and, and then after that, I kind of thought that might be the end of it. But um, fortunately, that was when the, uh, the, the, we heard the Canadian proposal at the, uh, at the OECD to you know, dig deeper into these issues. Fred, the committee chair at the OECD, was really interested in, in the topic. Uh, and so despite a fair amount of skepticism, it's, it's fair to say, um, the OECD asked myself and, and Estefania Santa Cruz Vasut, to, uh, who's a, a gender economic specialist, to, to go away and, and write a paper for the Global Forum on Competition that year that could kind of advance the thinking on what was really, uh, you know, just, just inroads into the topic at that time. I mean, there had been some uh, papers. Uh, so Sally Hubbard had written a couple of articles that were that kind of broached the topic. And so I was trying to draw a bit of attention to that and then kind of put it in a context that was recognisable for competition lawyers and economics, uh, economists, really. So, so that was kind of how we got to, to that stage. That's great. Thanks, Chris. And, and I will come back to you. I know you've written more subsequently, including at uh, CPI uh, in our Antitrust Chronicle on the topic. Um, that gets into, I think, a little bit more of a kind of forward thinking analysis of how we could take this topic a little bit deeper. Uh, but before we do that, maybe, maybe Catherine, I would like to get just your perspective as well. I think you've got, you know, uh, such an interesting uh, opportunity and uh, really looking ahead at what the CMA is doing with the Digital Markets Unit. Maybe you can tell us a bit about your role and even just starting with, you know, the, the concept of inclusive competition, how you're thinking about it in the context of what you're trying to achieve at the CMA. Thank you. Um, and just to say, I mean, thank you. It's a pleasure to be asked to speak on such an interesting topic on such a great panel. So thank you. Um, I mean, I think uh, rather selfishly, I'm probably more in taking mode than giving in this panel in the sense that with the digital markets unit, which is still in um, shadow form at the CMA. So we're awaiting legislation before it is formally given its new role, its new powers to promote greater competition in digital markets. We sort of have the luxury of a blank sheet of paper. 
So, you know, we're building a new function within the CMA from the ground up. That means, you know, new people, new approaches, new processes, new rules. And that means that we can really learn from the experiences of other um, authorities and other agencies and really ensure that we are starting from the outset with a body which is set up both um, to be inclusive in the way that it operates itself, but also in the way it carries out its, its functions. Um, so I can sort of like Jean very happily talk you through some of the things that we're thinking about from an agency perspective um, now or uh, in a bit, whatever suits you best, Anita. So Kat, why don't we start there and then maybe Jean, you can sort of take it from there and, and, and give us a bit of a, an update on where the Bureau is thinking about these things. So that'd be great. Of course. Um, so I sort of alluded to this, um, but there's there's sort of two elements to this. So in the UK, we have this thing called the public sector equality duty, and that requires us as a public sector body to uh, look at how we eliminate discrimination, we advance equality of opportunity, and we foster good relationships with between people with protected characteristics and those who don't. Um, and that applies, as I say, both within the CMA as a regulator, but also in how we carry out our statutory functions. So I'll sort of focus on those two buckets. One, what are we doing to promote inclusivity through our work um, and how are we organising ourselves as an agency to ensure that we operate in an inclusive way? So on how we promote inclusivity through our work. In recent years, I think you'll probably see that the CMA has focused more on more on looking at the impact of our work on different types of consumers and particularly looking at the experiences of vulnerable consumers. Um, and so we had a big programme of work focused on vulnerable consumers and actually you'll see through some of our casework that over the years we've prioritised more and more issues which are impacting on consumers who are vulnerable in some sense. So for example, we have done uh, market studies on care homes, on funeral providers um, and on guidance to IVF clinics um, on the sort of misleading claims that they might be making. So, um, you know, this is clearly factored into the way that we're prioritising our work. We've also been focusing more and more on outreach um, to ensure that we are understanding the um, sort of experiences of different groups of consumers in markets. Um, and just recently, we launched a new outreach program focused on working with third sector bodies um, on a range of issues like mental health, um, on BAME issues, on disability, on poverty and inequality. And this is really um, focus on making sure that we understand the experiences of those groups in markets and then we can use that to factor it into our work and therefore when we're looking at a particular case um, we've already got a foundational knowledge of um, both how to plug into those communities but also some of the sort of experiences or impact that particular behaviours might be having. Um, but I think, you know, we're clear there is always scope to go further. And as Jean said, we're really at the start of a journey here. Um, so we are asking ourselves some, you know, really hard questions around, well, actually, should we be more explicitly prioritising cases uh, which impact on um, protected groups? Um, should we be, you know, explicitly thinking about this in remedy design? Um, you know, when we've found a particular issue and are designing remedies, should we be explicitly looking at the impacts on particular groups to ensure that remedies are effective in delivering outcomes for all consumers? Um, so there's there's clearly scope, more scope and we're keen to learn, as I say, from others. Um, on the second piece around, well, how do we as an agency operate in an inclusive way? Um, you know, we it's it the business case is really clear you know i think we've always recognized as an authority that diversity of thought leads to better judgments better decisions and it's really important that we make sound decisions and that we're representative of the consumers that we're there to serve and we recent pu recently published an equality diversity and inclusion strategy and alongside this we're examining some of our processes so for example how do we build diverse case teams how do we ensure that our decision makers um, are diverse and you know this is building on things that are already commonplace within the cma so for example you know case teams are already multidisciplinary we already use teams from a range of different backgrounds 
but should we be explicitly focusing on um, sort of diversity and inclusion metrics within that? Um, and similarly, decision making. I mean, I'm sure as every competition authority, we have robust processes for ensuring that decisions are challenged. Sometimes we have separation of decision making, so you have a fresh pair of eyes. But actually, should we be ex explicitly applying a diversity and inclusion lens to that? Um, and again, these are all really interesting questions, keen to learn from others, and there's scope to go further. Um, so when it comes to the DMU, as I say, we're, we're on a blank sheet of paper, um, lots to learn. But I think, as I say, the real luxury of being able to set this up from the outset, um, you know, in, in a way that focus, in a way that you don't have to change later, that you can sort of set this up at the beginning in a way that, as I say, both we are an inclusive function or agency um, and that we are doing as much as we can in carrying out our work to promote inclusive outcomes. So um, very looking forward to this discussion and hopefully many more to come. All right, well, maybe I'll just uh, add, um, I think there's a lot, huge, a lot, a lot of commonality in, in terms of what Kat said and, and what, what we're experiencing. This is about asking questions. Like there aren't sort of real tangible examples of how this has impacted an outcome on a, on a case, but we are really thinking about um, discussing inclusive approaches to all aspects of our work. So enforcement, advocacy, compliance, and outreach, as well as, as Kat said, in our workplace. Um, so just a couple of examples on enforcement. We're thinking about ways that we can ask more nuanced questions about who's affected by anti-competitive activity um, and, and just incorporate that into our consideration of case selection and prioritization. So as Kat said, you know, we, we've always looked at vulnerable consumers, uh, but should we be looking at uh, gradations of vulnerability uh, so that we can identify the maximum impact that we can have on our work to increase participation, lower barriers and, and really contribute uh, to, to inclusive growth for our economy overall. Um, another example in enforcement is just, you know, we've always sort of looked at consumers as a homogenous group uh, in our analysis, and, and maybe we need to ask questions in appropriate cases as to whether or not uh, there's evidence that consumers actually see things differently from a demand perspective. Maybe the way we look at complementarity and substitutability is not necessarily reflective of how all consumers uh, view it. Um, another example could be just the way we look at barriers to entry and expansion. Uh, so, you know, access to capital may not be uniform across businesses. Uh, so, so that may be another nuance uh, that we could look at in our analysis. Uh, and then finally, on the enforcement side, you know, anti-competitive effects. Is, is there a way to dig deeper? Is there available data to dig deeper to identify any particular impacts that, that uh, within our antitrust analysis um, using the data we have. Um, then you've got the advocacy side. So, you know, we're really looking at uh, targeting our work at markets that have the potential to reduce those barriers for marginalized groups to then again, improve participation in our economy and overall improve competitiveness and productivity and innovation and all the benefits that it brings to our entire economy. Um, on compliance and outreach, uh, you know, we're, we're really looking at um, targeting organizations that serve equity seeking entrepreneurs and small and medium sized enterprises. And, and we've actually started doing this and we found that discussing things like gender, race and diversity uh, implications has the added benefit of actually boosting interest in competition policy overall and, and frankly awareness that we even exist as an, as an agency uh, and, and have a role to play. Um, and then, you know, as, as an employer, as Kat said, like we, we do view uh, diversity and inclusion as really uh, core to what we do, um, not only because we need to represent, be represented with the population that we're, we're serving, but because it helps our analysis, like it, it enriches our analysis and decision making. Um, leads to more innovative approaches in, in how we go about doing our work. Uh, and our work is, is pretty complex. And the more we can kind of challenge each other, bring diverse perspectives and experience to our analysis, uh, discussions, debates, um, you know, I, I truly believe the better informed our decision making can be. So we are putting a lot of uh, emphasis on 
you know, do we have the right mix of skill sets? Do we have the right mix of backgrounds? Are there ways that we can diversify that uh, to enrich our work? Um, and, you know, that, that, that's everything from recruitment to how we go about having our discussions, making sure that there are inclusion strategies so that no voices are left unheard uh, and, and views are free to be expressed. Um, so maybe I'll, you know, leave it at that uh, and, and, and happy to discuss any other questions you have. That's great, thanks, Jean. Uh, you know, maybe Chris, I'd, I'd, I'd like to get, I guess, at your perspective, having been at the OECD, having heard a variety of different agencies speak about this topic, um, you know, what do you see as sort of the barriers, if you will? Uh, you mentioned a bit of skepticism on the idea of bringing in inclusive competition as a consideration. Um, but then I hear Jean and Kat, you know, talking, and, and I, I don't know that it is really a significant shift in the way that you know the agencies are doing their work it's perhaps maybe another data point to bring into the analysis um maybe i can throw that question to you and then we can we can all um you know chime in if you cat or gene if you have any other views on that sure um yeah i i i can i can see the, the the slight contradiction there i think i think what i would say is that when we when we brought the topic kind of to discussion originally i think it conjured in people's minds the idea of uh, public interest tests, um, perhaps some of the sort of cases for an exception to competition law, which, which have been a feature of the discussion about green antitrust in, in, in recent uh, months and years. Um, and I think we we consciously kind of took a, a different approach and uh, tried to, you know, think about what you could and should be doing within the existing framework. Uh, that, that didn't require you to sort of turn that upside down. I think those are interesting questions in and of themselves. Um, but I think, I think by by putting it within the existing framework and sort of thinking how can you push that further and and what else are the opportunities? You we we managed to uh, come up with ideas that were interesting for for agencies and that agencies started to think well this is stuff that you know we could put into practice if we if we can just nail down some sort of specifics around what we do uh with these ideas but this is not going to entail you know a, a rewrite of the of the rule book sort of thing in order to put it into practice so i think you can kind of divide it into those different pots in terms of what what you look at in in terms of making changes in this space um and that, and that makes sense. And, and, I, and I guess maybe just uh, to pick up on that, is it, to my mind, I guess, is it a question of having the right data to enable this type of consideration? And if so, is that um, you know, kind of a, another, as you say, data point that we can start to think about collecting so that it informs our analysis? Or, or is it, um, you know, I guess I'd maybe just stop there. Is that something that we think could help in terms of whether uh, it's an appropriate data point that can be included in certain cases or not. I mean, certainly from my perspective, I think um, I think what's becoming clear in some of the projects that the OECD are doing is that you know it's not that complicated to collect list data, and this is something that Jean and the Canadian Bureau have, have found in some of their work. I know so. Uh, you know, that is, it's not that difficult to get hold of some additional data on here. What that data tells you will obviously depend on the specific case, but um, the, the cost in terms of taking a look and, and sort of getting to the bottom, that might not be that dramatic in the first instance. I mean, so I, I, I think certainly there is a, a matter of let's ask those questions and, and try and explore whether there is an issue in, in a given market to, to, to get into. Yeah, maybe I'll add to that, Anita. Like I, I, I agree. Like I, I think you know, as competition enforcers, we are, we are within the context of the economy that we operate in and the markets that we that we're looking at. Um, and you know, the facts that are relevant to supply, demand, market power, rivalry, and effects in any particular case, are are also potentially relevant when we're looking at a more nuanced analysis. Um, and many businesses, you know, if, if there is a meaningful nuance, it may be driving their business to behavior and, and decision making. So there, there may, there's a lot of cases, particularly maybe in some consumer driven markets where businesses see an opportunity to target or, or actually are collecting that data because they see it as meaningful in, the, in their 
um, in their efforts to compete, uh, to market, to, to find revenue growth and demand growth. Um, so in those cases, you know, the, I think there is data available that, that we can just look at maybe in a deeper way, slice it differently, look at it more nuanced. Uh, in other cases, you know, that, that might not be the case. And we'll have to evaluate whether there are other reliable data sources that may exist. But, you know, we, we, we are within our framework. We do have to make sure that we have credible and reliable data and that will always um, be at the core of what we do. Uh, you know, I, I think as we're looking forward to digital markets and, you know, that's a huge priority for the Canadian Competition Bureau as well. Um, big data is everywhere. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I would suspect that there's a lot of data that we may be able to leverage in those markets in particular as we start to look at intelligence gathering uh, using AI uh, in, in that capacity. And, and that may actually help not just looking at the data that's relevant within a market, but looking at uh, what's going on within the context of that market. Perhaps if I jump in as well, and um, this might not be what you expect the person with the digital nameplate on to say. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I completely agree. Um, data is a really important part of, of this work. But, uh, you know, I, when I was doing work on, um, I previously came from financial services, and in financial services, there's been a very big debate about gender diversity on boards or diversity more broadly on boards. And I remember someone saying to me, if you just replace the Henrys with the Henriettas, you can get perfect diversity stats, but you haven't brought necessarily any diversity of thought. And I think that principle applies, you know, when you are looking at data on this subject, um, you know, whether that's about, as I say, the, the, the data data on that kind of subject but also on you know how does a particular anti-competitive behavior impact on different groups with different protected characteristics there is also an element of um getting under the skin of what is that actually telling you and therefore the outreach the speaking to the third sector organizations you know the qualitative um analysis that alongside that works alongside that sort of data analysis and the quantitative analysis is really really important um so i completely agree that data is important um but it's got to go alongside i think that sort of qualitative piece right and there are some um you mentioned the the financial services um i think there are some studies being done worldwide that talk about you know diversity and the benefits from uh you know a overall performance perspective there's one in um Canada was done the U of T that talked about uh, really the benefits of disrupting group think. And, and what I thought was interesting, maybe to your point, Kat, is that they, they looked at the benefits of having, I think it was, you know, a couple of female directors, that was a, you know, a real benefit from a fraud perspective, this was, but when you had too many, um, the, the group think shifted the other way. Um, so, you know, I think that that sort of supports what you're you're seeing it's just as you say more of a holistic approach um and with maybe the the goal being um understanding what the diversity brings but it, it is still diversity that's the, the goal and i mean i think that's um that was one of the things that i actually took away from some of the work that chris wrote um is actually the opportunity here actually you know when you start understanding how diversity can affect the decision making of these firms and then particularly with the digital you know as we start regulating the really big platforms actually you know if you can understand that um a particular you know that greater diversity brings you greater compliance or um you know greater whistleblowing for example you know that's really really important to you as a regulator um, and again, coming back to financial services, I think it's really interesting that in the UK, the financial regulator, you know, has really pushed about, um, you know, questioning actually whether its role should be to actually, you know, almost regulate this when it comes to financial institutions, have a role in thinking about whether their, you know, boards are diverse enough, very much with the view that actually, if they do have diverse boards, then they will make better decisions and they will deliver better products and stuff to consumers you know i think it's really interesting to think about what diversity tells you as a regulator about the firms you're regulating and you know coming into digital and big tech which is you know traditionally probably as undiverse as divest, uh, investment banking um you know there, there's some really interesting things to learn in parallels 
Great. And, and I do think, you know, Chris, you had some interesting uh, initial tidbits in your first paper with Estefania about the angle of compliance and uh, how, uh, you know, from the, I think from the ICN study database, there aren't that, that many, it's not to say that there's none, but there aren't as many um, women who are involved in antitrust uh, offenses, um, which I thought was an interesting one. And, and I think, you know, building on that, there's maybe more work to be done to, you, to your point, Kat, to understand how whistleblowing programs can be designed to, you know, encourage, uh, you know, really the whistleblowing itself. So what are the components that are important to different people in, in design, I think is also something that, you know, it, it's, it's helpful to understand those, um, really those interplays of the factors that, that come into designing, so. Um, but I don't know, Chris, if you had any other thoughts coming out of, of that discussion from your end of, of things, having looked at this more deeply. Um, yeah, I mean, just to just to say, yeah, that 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 was coming out of the uh, the Connor database of uh, international uh, cartels. Right. Yeah, the OECD is working on, and yeah, it, it's notable how how few. But obviously, the the kind of the I guess the number of um, women on boards, unfortunately, during a lot, a lot of that period was pretty small as well. So that that was some controlling we, we did there, but it still it still looks very low. And so that's some of the kind of analysis that is being done uh, as part of that OECD um, uh, project at the moment to try and sort of get a bit further into whether that whether that holds in, in different sort of data sets and what might be explaining it, as we say, that that's that kind of diversity of of, uh, of thought across the board seems to be a very intuitively a, a really uh, a sensible explanation of that and certainly there's some support from from other white collar um, sort of offenses uh, for, for those sorts of issues so I think that's that's a that's a good lead to, to, to follow on right right and I think there's some work that NASDAQ has done as well that talks about this this concept as well and, and to your point Kat really throws out the idea of whether or not um, diversity is beneficial or should it be a component of, of um, regulators you know, mandates going forward um, you know, I, I guess two thoughts you know thinking about um, you know the challenges to trying to bring this concept of inclusive competition forward um, I just wanted to get your uh, your thoughts on what really do you see as the challenges is there an opportunity from a multilateral international perspective for collaboration? Uh, is, is there still stakeholder, um, you know, really skepticism um, and, and how are we, you know, how are we to answer those, uh, you know, skeptics that say, well, this is to your point, Chris, maybe something that seems a little further afield um, than, than traditional antitrust considerations. Well, maybe I'll, I'll start. I, I think it's, you know, based on our journey, it is a journey and, um, and, and awareness is key. So, you know, people are, are very, well, at our agency, we're, we're really lucky. We have a lot of incredibly intelligent, intellectually curious. They love facts. They love data. They love looking at, at things in a nuanced way. So internally, I think we have a very strong foundation. Um, in terms of, you know, outside stakeholders, I think it is kind of bringing them along our journey to say, this is not revolutionary. Um, this is this is actually core to what we do and can actually help us impact and, and have the impacts that, that are core to our mandate uh, as a competition agency. Um, so, I, I, and, and on the international front, I mean, I think it's been hugely helpful uh, and will continue to be hugely helpful to discuss these issues in forums like the OECD. Um, the OECD uh, always gives credibility to issues uh, because of the quality of research, because of the quality of the dialogue that they're having and seeing the engagement um, that, that Chris was talking about, you know, from the beginning, like, oh, is this, is this antitrust to, yeah, it is antitrust and this is how we can do it within our frameworks. Um, I, I think is hugely important. And, you know, for us as agencies, we always learn so much uh, from each other uh, that helps us leverage the learning, the lessons learned, what worked, what didn't, uh, what, can I, what can we adapt to our own frameworks? Um, you know, in, in my, my view, we're always really good at cooperating despite maybe different priorities or different frameworks in certain 
uh, in certain cases, and, and we find those ways to leverage uh, those, those learnings in our work. And I, I see this as, a, as an area where, we're, where we will continue to do that. And then also just, just as an employer, um, you know, we're, we're, as management in, in these agencies, we are talking to one another, like how, what are the skill sets that, that you found to be helpful to add into the mix at your agency? Where are the recruitment opportunities? Uh, what's worked for you to share those ideas so that, you know, we can all uh, benefit from, from each other's experiences? I just second what what Jean said. I mean, I, I guess um, a lot of my time at the moment, you know, is obviously focused on the activities of the digital platforms and, you know, international engagement on that is key. You know, the um, they are multi jurisdictional firms, what they do in one jurisdiction often they do across the world and you have all different regulatory authorities tackling the same issues and more and more comparing notes on you know how did you put together your information request what information was useful to gather how did you frame your analysis i mean we just it's the calls are so frequent and so um you know sometimes it almost feels like an extension of your own team and actually it strikes me that on this it's quite similar um you know that again it is a they are issues which transcend jurisdictional boundaries and therefore there's the same opportunity to be you know having that in quite perhaps more a more systematic way that sort of constant comparing of notes um you know we've done an outreach program here this is what it's told us you know we've been focusing over here on remedy design we'll share you know what we've learned from that i i think there's huge value in that we'd be really up for it um and you know really keen to do more of it that's great I guess I wanted to also explore a bit whether there are any other areas, maybe from a substantive perspective, that uh, lend themselves to inclusive competition considerations. Um, you know, I, I think we've talked about selection of cases and prioritization, given that, you know, all the agencies really face a decision of where to prioritize their resources. Um, there's, there's that. But I, I also wondered if you know, Jean, maybe to your point about understanding how consumers view markets, but also how maybe consumers uh, view, you know, maybe even advertising and extending it to consumer protection um, cases. We may, I think they're called consumer protection cases outside Canada. We still, it's still part of the Competition Act, but, um, uh, you know, advertising and the like. I wondered if there is a, an area or if you have any thoughts where it's almost an a easier um, way to think about or an easier sell, if you will, to bring the concept of inclusive competition forward. Um, you know, just stop there and see if you have any thoughts on that. Shall I jump in? I mean, um, probably unsurprisingly, I'll talk about digital. Um, and I think digital is a challenge, but also a huge opportunity. So in digital markets, we know that, um, you know, for example, in online advertising, that there is more personalization and more tailoring than perhaps, you know, we've ever seen in the economy before. And therefore, there's a, you know, there's real prospect of harm um, and exploiting people with particular protected characteristics, mental health concerns, you know, whatever it is. So there's evidently, you know, real challenge and real, um, as I say, real prospect of harm, but also there's real opportunity. And I think I particularly think about two buckets. One you can use that tailoring the other way so actually there's an opportunity for firms to tailor their services to actually enable people with protected characteristics to better access services and i think you do see some examples of that but i think you know particularly in the uk and you know some of what we've seen in the press recently there's a huge way to go um but also that means there's data for us as agencies if if firms are routinely tailoring um, their services in that way then actually when we come to design remedies we should be able to access and use that same data and sort of an analytical techniques to focus and improve our remedy design to ensure that um, the remedy is effective for all different groups of consumers so i think you know there are significant concerns but also there should be significant opportunities in digital um, and you may be aware that um, at the cma we've recently launched a behavioral hub um, which is a team of data scientists and behavioral scientists very much focused on understanding how firms are using 
um, sort of algorithms and choice architecture to steer consumer decision making. Um, and again, I mean, that's just our way of starting to think about, well, this is what the firms are doing. How can we utilize, you know, those kind of skills and analysis techniques as a regulator? Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's that hopefully should give us um, much more capability when it comes to taking this kind of um, this kind of activity forward. Yeah, and I would I, I would say we're we're trying to learn from the CMA. I mean, it, it, it's a it's it's a strategic priority for the Canadian Competition Bureau to look at ways to improve our intelligence gathering efforts to look at data in in ways that are beyond evaluation of a case evaluation of effects to proactively um, identify opportunities for us to to have more of an impact on our economy to um, to do our jobs kind of next level uh, so you know we're setting up a digital unit we are uh, working very closely with all our international counterparts to to learn from that to figure out how we can leverage that data I would say on in terms of you know strategic priority sectors um i'm not sure like we're, we're certainly asking those questions and we're certainly looking at it in a more nuanced way uh but you know a lot of the consumer um the consumer focused uh um, markets like pharma um those are ones that i think you know they they've been a priority and it, it's really just, is there a way to, to bring our analysis and bring our prioritization next level? Um, uh, and I, I can't really, you know, there, there's some really good research out there. There's an IMF paper, uh, you know, the work of the OECD, which, which does sort of identify sectors where we may want to be asking more nuanced questions. Uh, and I think that's also informing uh, the way we're looking at it um, in terms of where should we be asking the questions? Where should we be maybe delving a little deeper? Great. Uh, so Chris, I know you recently contributed a paper to CPI that, I, that you know, as I said at the beginning, I think kind of takes things um, you know, to a different level in terms of uh, you know, thinking. Maybe you can uh, give us a, a bit of an overview of your, your, um, your paper but also sort of the, the OECD projects, you mentioned uh, you know, a couple that are underway and maybe Jean, you can fill in some of the, you know, the, OECD, the um, Bureau's involvement rather in those projects that have been you know, to some degree funded and, and the work that's being done there to kind of further the, the analysis, if you will, in this area. Sure, thanks Anita. Um, yeah, if, if I could just give you a brief kind of overview of the, of, of, of the paper and then I'll move on to the OECD stuff. Um, I mean, certainly the paper is, is an attempt to go a little, as you say, further than some of the suggestions that we kind of put down in, in some of the initial OECD work and just to sort of push the envelope just a little bit further and think about an, an elaboration of, of some of these ideas. Um, I guess the, 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 the starting point with, with the paper was really this idea that um, if you think about inclusive competition kind of uh, as an attempt to reconcile competition and equality kind of goals, that to me uh, reminded me of, uh, you know, the kind of John Rawls's efforts to reconcile liberalism and equality and, and how he developed these principles of justice to help, you know, offer one answer to, to how you might do that, certainly an answer that you know, I find quite attractive. Um, and so in the paper, I kind of run through the different principles of justice that he, he put down and, and I try and tr draw across uh, those into how we might interpret those within a, a, an antitrust or competition policy kind of sphere. Um, and I suppose one of the big things that, that I kind of get to within that is that to me, and this goes back to some OECD um, uh, work and, and indeed to the UK, um, this idea that what you might need to go beyond, so to go beyond what you have at the moment in terms of the framework and to think about inclusivity beyond that might be some sort of secondary objective. Um, now, this is something in the UK we've got, in, um, uh, certainly some of the regulators have got in terms of having secondary competition objectives. And that we hear is very helpful in terms of uh, bringing a kind of cohesive cross government approach to solving you know, competition problems, because well, you, you reduce the scope for, for conflict um, of different policy uh, aspects. 
And so one of the suggestions I make in the paper that I, I think would be really interesting is, is if competition, uh, competition policy or competition law were to have some sort of secondary uh, inclusivity objective, which would be subsidiary in the sense that it would recognize that, you know, we've got the consumer welfare standard or whatever we want to call the, the consumer welfare standard as our kind of primary concern. But we have quite a lot of uh, room for maneuver often in some of our choices uh, below that, which we might want to be very clear about how they're being governed. Uh, and so I think a secondary inclusivity objective would be something that would kind of hardwire in some of the proposals and changes that we've kind of heard as suggestions, both in terms of prioritization, uh, the way we do our analysis, the way we define markets and, and, and these sort of aspects. Uh, and then I suppose on the, at, the, at the end, I've, I've put in some sort of, uh, I don't know, stretch possibilities. Um, certainly, we are having a bit of a debate at the moment about the idea of uh, where does the rebuttable presumption lie in different types of markets, uh, you know, potential competition cases and so forth. And so one of the ideas I floated there was the idea that certain markets have got quite a lot of potential to have a large inclusivity cost if they're not working very well, because the costs are largely felt by marginalized communities, while the, uh, the benefits of greater efficiency aren't always uh, on the producer side, uh, can often be for, for those who are, are, are less marginalized. And so you might have some markets where it may, might make sense to, to have a different rebuttable presumption. Um, or indeed, you might say, well, in general, you know, a lack of enforcement, if we think about that type one, type two kind of error cost, uh, is it that we've got certain communities that are tending to bear the, the burden of, of some of the costs on one of those sides? And so is that a reason to think about drawing a different sort of rebuttable presumption? Um, and so, so those, I think, are bits at the edge of the framework where you could think about elaborating what we have. Um, obviously, more recently, I've been thinking a lot more about private enforcement. And I think there you can also think in terms of class actions, the fact, you know, whether you want them to be opt in in a way to draw, make sure that you're including uh, people within within actions rather than um, making it difficult for them to access those things. And so I think that there's, there's an interesting um, set of issues there as well. Um, but if I just say a bit about the OECD um, projects to, to, to wrap up, um, it's worth having a look at the site. I think we've got the, the, the recording of the, the, the uh, workshop that happened in February. We've got seven presentations there from the different people who are, who are doing the research. We've got a number of projects looking into the cartel and the whistleblower question, um, whether, whether you're more likely to, to, to have cartels formed if you've got a greater diversity of, of decision makers involved uh, using different data sets, different sort of um, experimental techniques and so forth. Um, you've got some really interesting projects about surveys and, and the different results you can get by asking different questions in surveys. Um, you've got one group that are looking at um, simulations uh, of, of competitive effects and HHIs and looking at how that could make the difference where taking a gender lens could make a real difference in some of the conclusions that you get to within a case. Um, and then we've also got obviously this prioritization point, which Bill Kovacic is, is, is taking a look at and even a discussion of this public interest angle from a group in, in South Africa who are kind of relaying some of the um, learning that they've had from having a kind of a public interest test that has focused on um, historically uh, disadvantaged persons and, and the difference that that makes uh, and to see how that feeds into the debate about, you know, what the toolkit should look like. Because certainly we're hoping, or the OECD is hoping, I should say, uh, from that to, to be developing um, uh, lessons that can inform a toolkit that would, you know, provide um, practical advice to, to, to agencies around the OECD and beyond uh, on, on what they could be doing on this and to kind of give a bit of a menu of, menu of options. So that's, that's a, a nutshell of, of what the OECD are up to on this, I believe. And maybe just uh, on the Canadian side, like we we obviously, um, especially I think it's it's really crystallized for us looking looking at at coming out of the pandemic uh, and Government of Canada priorities to 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 put inclusive growth um, at the center of our recovery efforts, and, and so it's kind of um, I guess for lack of a better term, an opportunity to double down, I, I think as an agency, because with every crisis, there comes an opportunity. We see a huge opportunity here. 
but but the opportunity is from looking at our work holistically from from soup to nuts um learning uh investing in that research learning from our international counterparts and then another huge part is learning from uh, the amazing people we have within the organization who are incredibly intellectually curious uh, who are experts in their analysis uh, to really leverage them to find are, are there additional questions that we should be asking are there additional data sources that you have seen that we should be looking at in a more nuanced way are there new uh, data sets that we should be looking at in, in our work. And I think that's where we're at is just um, soup to nuts looking at what are the ways that we can double down on this, uh, use the tools that we have within the framework we have uh, to, to leverage the strength of the organization, to leverage the strength of evidence to then hopefully impact what all of us as competition agencies want to do, which is contribute to better recovery, better productivity, better competition, better innovation coming out of this. Um, and and you, know, you, you look at those marginalized groups, they represent a disproportionate opportunity in the recovery. If we can leverage and get their participation up, remove the barriers uh, to, to their participation so we can maximize their participation in the overall economy and improve our GDP uh, in Canada. And Kat, did you want to add anything there in terms of your perspective of where we're, we're heading next steps, even from, from your end? I know it's early days um, at the CMA. I mean, I was just going to say, how could you not sign up to, you know, the, the business case that Jean just set out? I mean, um, the case is so compelling, um, you know, and I, I think we're in a really similar place as an agency. Um, I think we see, have a, I think we see the, you know, a, a clear case for for doubling down as, as Jean put it um, and really thinking about well you know how can we ensure we are doing the utmost um, in this area to, to, to be ourselves a more inclusive um, agency and to promote more inclusive outcomes in the work that we do. Um, I mean in terms of, of next steps I mean I, I think I'd say more of the same and go further so I I think the point the, the point you made earlier in the discussion around you know international joining up um i think there's a huge amount we can learn from each other i'm really keen that you know we keep this debate live i think the you know the work the oecd is doing and the nine the different work streams will be really really um important contribution to this subject area and i'm sort of keen to ensure that we're contributing and doing as much as we can to to as i say to learn from each other um, and very selfishly, that will help us in, in our work as we establish the DMU. And Chris, any thoughts from you in terms of whether we can expect another paper or are you um, <laughs> getting any take up on your stretch goals from any other uh, stakeholders in the area? Um, I mean, there's, there seems to be a lot of interest in the, in, the, in the topic. The buzz on this has continued to kind of grow as time has gone by really. I think from all private practitioners, from agencies and so forth. And so I think there's there's certainly continued interest in the topic. Um, I guess at the moment in a, in a few countries, we're seeing you know debates about what the direction of anti-trust is gonna be. So I think you know I, it's good to have uh, you know these different options on the table and to bring this inclusivity question into, into some of that debate. Um, where that goes we'll, we'll we'll wait and see but i think it's it's got a place in that so certainly seeing i think um uh, commissioner slaughter had uh you know a significant amount of input into you know the, the really the framing of the issue from her perspective and a series of, of tweets which made me you know sign up for twitter um but uh, but it, i think is contributing to the discussion as you say and uh, another kind of uh, inflection point if you will on on what the, you know, the different perspectives are. Um, I wanted to you know, throw it open to Jean or Kat for any uh, final comments at all. I think we're, we're close to over our, our time here, but um, just wanted to, if not, thank you all for participating, but just again, final thoughts on where we would like to head or, or whether, um, you know, how you are seeing things from, from your agency's perspective, aside from you know, the goals we've talked about in terms of things that we can all be doing from, from a um, discussion perspective uh, going forward. 
Uh, I would just, again, double down on what Kat said, which is, I think it's it's really important for us to learn from each other to unlock the potential of, of this issue. I think, you know, you've seen probably from all of us, you know, what started out as a question has been confirmatory that we need to continue. Um, and that, you know, there are many areas of our work where, where we can have a more significant impact by looking at things in a more nuanced way without divorcing ourselves from, you know, this is, this is not revolutionary. This is actually core to what we do. Um, and uh, as we look forward to where the economy is going, I think, and where, where society is going, at least in Canada, I, I think it's a reflection, as always, of the context that we're in and the markets that we regulate uh, and, and our core mandate. And, you know, I, I think you'll continue to see the Canadian Competition Bureau see huge upside uh, to learning from others, continuing the debate, and continuing the research in this area so that we can be more informed. Okay, any final thoughts? Not really, I guess just um, very excited to have, as I say, the luxury of a blank sheet of paper um, and to be able to think about this from the ground up, to build it from the ground up, to sort of set up. We've got a huge way to grow in terms of building the DMU, in terms of recruitment, in terms of setting up the legislation, in terms of then setting up our governance, the institution, um, the institutional arrangements as a whole. And therefore at every single turn, at every single decision-making point, we have an opportunity to say, well, how do we build this in the most inclusive way possible? And that's key in the tech sector, um, which is built around promoting greater competition, greater dynamism, greater innovation. You know, that's all, that all comes, stems from diversity of perspectives and thought and challenge so um it's a real opportunity for us um and as Jean said I mean just I can't emphasize enough keen to learn great well thank you everyone thank you for your time and thank you to CPI for organizing and, and providing the the platform for the chronicle and also for this discussion I think that's uh been a, a very uh, interesting discussion from my end of things and I look forward to continuing and hearing uh, you know the the fruits of this discussion and, and furthering discussion as we go forward. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.